this is going to be a relatively quick video and I'm not going to go into the full, full details of it. Uh, I'll save that for a later video when I've worked it out a bit better. But I just wanted to do something on this because I've been posting it to Instagram um, as I've been learning. And it's the reason that I haven't been posting many YouTube videos because I've been playing with a new project. Now, some of you will have watched the video from a month or two back where I talked about efficient uh, glaze testing and how I use these little SteriFeed bottles to mean that I can dip a test tile in less glaze and therefore get more glaze tests out of the same starting amount. And the idea with that video was that if you combine um, different glazes in the right sequence, you can make more effective use of the mix. And I said almost as a throwaway comment in the video about how um, you could get away with less glaze if you could displace more of the volume. Um, but I hadn't really kind of given it much thought because it's not something you can throw on the wheel. You know, I, th I will throw my test tiles. These are round. So the only way you could throw something that would effectively fill that space is either to make it incredibly thick and, th and cut just cubes of um, the thrown test tiles the way I normally do them or throw them individually. So it's not something that was plausible with wheel thrown ones. So I, I kind of said it was a throwaway thing, but it stuck with me. And it, it, it had been an idea that had kind of been rattling around in my head for a while. Um, but essentially you could slip cast them. And I don't like slip casting. I've tried working with plaster before. It's messy, making molds well is an art form and it's not one that I particularly wanted to learn. But if you don't take your time, you end up with horribly messy molds and plaster everywhere. And so it wasn't a process that I enjoyed. And, um, you know, there's a skill to it that I, I didn't want to, there wasn't something that I wanted to do. But um, a lot of you will be familiar with Kurt Hamley and the way he makes molds. And that appealed to me a lot more. Um, there's a barrier to entry, a very high barrier to entry in some regards, but it doesn't require that physical skill of making a perfect mould where if you make a mistake while making the mould, you get either an inferior or non-functioning mould. You can design something in 3D, and so long as you can then work through every step sequentially of the, the process that he uses, you can end up with an actual nicely made mould without the sort of manual skill that a lot of bulb makers have. Obviously that's in no way meant to imply that Kurt's not incredibly skilled at what he does, but from my perspective he'd moved the skill to a digital realm rather than learning the mechanical process of um, masking off with clay. Um, when you watch someone who really knows what they're doing but does it manually like Van Tickey, he makes these incredible multi-piece molds, but he makes them, he sculpts something, and then he sculpts how each plaster piece of the mold comes off the main mold and does it all by hand. And I just, I can't begin to comprehend you know, that, that aspect of it. But when it's digital, that I can do. So it appealed to me, but the barrier to entry is you've got to have a 3D printer, and then you've got to be able to you've got to be able to design your design and then you've got to be able to 3D print it and then you've got to be able to make a silicon mold of it and then you've got to cast in plaster and then you've got to plaster, uh, cast in slip. So there's this sort of, there's a lot of processes to get it to work and if that's not what you do, then there has to be a good reason for it. Anyway, this seemed like the perfect thing to test it on because it's small, it's easy. If I want to cast them, there's a point to it, um, but also it doesn't require that much slip, it doesn't require you know, it's not a huge commitment in the way that trying to turn my studio into a slip casting studio would be. Anyway, long and short of it is here are the test tiles. I'll put a picture up rather than just having this still, but um, they work. So I'll show you everything I've got in a second, but the idea is that you have a one of the little stereo feed beakers and these displace basically not quite the entire volume. I didn't want them to displace the entire volume, although I could have made them do that because um, when it gets too close to the edge, you actually start to stick to it and things like that. So you, you want a, a little bit of wiggle room and I don't know what the optimal amount is and maybe I could have 
made these fill more space or maybe they'd be better if they filled less. Anyway, they're what I did. But the idea being that they're little monoliths as well, so you can actually, they're, they're something that you want to keep afterwards. They're ornamental enough um, to be worth keeping. So, what I have done is I'm very, someone very kindly printed this for me, Brizzle Pots on Instagram. Um, so I designed this. This is based on how Kurt does his moulds from my observations and Kurt very kindly allowed me to bounce ideas off him. So at each um, step where I've been trying to work something through, if I get stuck, I can ask him, which is very handy. But in general, I was just aiming to replicate what it looked like he was doing. Um, this mould is designed to be rotationally tessellatable, essentially. So rather than having these two, I um, can't think of what you call them now, but they're kind of locating pins. These, are, these go down, these go up. And what that means is when you flip it over on itself, it fits uh, against itself. So I only need one of these and I cast two identical pieces and they fit together. There's this um, kind of slip reservoir there that I trim off to get the foot um, the way that I want it. So there's sort of this extra layer, which is why it steps twice. There's impulse dots on there. That's the other advantage to casting these. I'd never put impulse dots on my test tiles because to manually add impulse dots to test tiles would take forever and um, well, I could do it, I suppose, if I wanted. But you know, the great thing with this is you only do it once and that's it. You design it in computer and they're all identical. Um, so you get that. Then you have to build a wooden frame around it and you cast the um, 3D printed, this resin 3D printed, by the way, and printed not on my printer, but on the, the same printer I ended up buying. This is what Kurt uses, and this is what the this test was printed on, Anycubic Mono X 4K. Um, so the resin print gives a very smooth finish already and doesn't need to be um, sanded or fillered, which a lot of people um, prime and sand back when they're using uh, PLA, which is the, the kind of normal, what you think of, no, not PLA, sorry. Yeah, no, PLA. The, the FDM, the the normal extruded plastic 3D printers, those need to be sanded back so you don't see the lines, whereas you don't get that so much in a resin one because the resolution's higher. Um, you cast that in silicon. This is Mold Max 40. Again, what Kurt uses, I don't see any reason to use anything else as a test one. Um, and I haven't seen one that would work. They've got to be tin cured to work with the resin apparently i think that's right um so there is a, a, a possibility that if you get one that's the wrong one it won't work because it won't cure against the resin um so i just use my max 40. Uh, i haven't found anything particularly cheaper so i'll probably stick with it it's pricey stuff i've got an idea for how i might be able to avoid using so much of it but equally um i think i was borderline using too little with this one if you see kurt's ones he makes those a bit fatter and you'll end up mine don't fit together absolutely perfectly and so maybe that contributed to it also the um print warped slightly i don't know whether that affected the face um so there are definitely uh, barriers to getting this to work but what you do is you take this and you keep it in its wooden surround and you pour plaster into it. The plaster doesn't stick to the silicon and you get out of that plaster molds. So you just keep part casting from uh, the silicon and you keep getting identical molds. Now I have not done a fantastic job of getting the air bubbles out of them so you can see there's imperfections in these. You know this is the whole point of this is it's a learning process and this was something where it didn't really matter um, but there are definite things that I can improve on. But you get two of them, you put them together like this, you now have a castable plaster block with your location pins. Um, plastic pins around it, and that is now castable. So you pour the slip in, what happens is the plaster sucks the moisture 
from the slip from the outside in essentially so the longer you leave it the more of a slip deposit builds up around it and that's how you slip cast but all that means is that I pour 70 mil of slip into there and I don't really pull that much back out but I do pour some out because they are hollow um, but obviously makes it very easy to do in a small studio I can just mix up or buy um, five litres of slip and that'll do me you know 100 test tiles probably somewhere in the ballpark of that they'll all be identical they'll all be these little monoliths um, you can do two different designs so you could have different sides to the tile uh, the reason I've done them the same is because I prefer to have two colours of slip on my tiles and what I can do is I can brush black slip onto one half and then one half it's black the other half it's light clay so I can test two that way um, and that's essentially the whole process that leads to having these test tiles and the process worked well enough that I bought myself uh, a very reasonably priced actually uh, resin printer so bearing in mind that can print this mold piece um, and this mold this size of mold piece is all you need to do mugs and things like that because this isn't even actually maxing out the bed close to it but um, yeah you can print like a, a multi-section mold for a mug and you can do it all on that printer and it's 450 pounds which in the context of if you're making a, a living from ceramics almost nothing I've bought in the studio has cost that little. So the camera I'm recording this on significantly more, kiln far more, wheel far more. You know, it's one of the cheapest things. Um, the material, not hugely expensive. I thought it was gonna be worse than it is. So this would be maybe five, six pounds worth of resin, if you're just using a cheap resin. This is about 50 quid worth of uh, silicon, so the silicon's the pricey bit, which if I can find a way of using, and also this is the problematic bit because it um, takes 24 hours to cure, um, and it's it'll seep out if you don't seal it well enough. I went a bit overboard with hot glue going and everything together, but um, that was only because I'd heard the horror stories of someone not doing that, leaving a small gap, and because it takes so long to cure, it has a very long time to just trickle out and you'll come back into it everywhere and you just have to wait for it to cure uh, before you can get it off but um, yeah this whole thing has cost me far more than you'd want to spend on making test tiles necessarily but on the other hand if these are little uh, like kind of desktop gaming monoliths or little ornaments that people would want and I sold them for you know say 50p a test tile it's not going to take too many test tiles before it's paid me back for the materials on these. Um, but also, I get much better test tiles as a result. Um, but also, there are various things, like obviously you couldn't throw these, and there are other things like the pipes, where I want to get consistency to the throwing, um, because I don't know for certain what factors affect how well it works. I'd like it to be consistent and the easiest way to get consistency is to slip cast but things like that where um, this could be a very interesting process so I think this is going to be a longer video than I intended but just kind of running you through where I'm at with this um, I will do a much more in-depth um, edited down version showing you the processes um, when I'm a bit more comfortable with it I haven't done an anywhere near enough of it to kind of start telling you what to do <laughs> let I mean I can barely tell you what I'm doing let alone um, give any advice about it but um, this is something I'm going to be playing with over the next few months to try and get actual sellable things um, and possibly this is going to become integrated into my studio process as a more permanent thing maybe it will be um, one-off specials but slip casting gives you opportunities for creating pieces that you can't create any other way. Just even down to uh, the way you can layer up colours and carve back through them, like Forest Ceramico do. Um, you know, you can have multi-coloured different. The, the, 
each piece of the, the mould can be a different colour. It's much easier to incorporate a colour into slip than it is thrown clay and so on and so forth. So there's loads of possibilities. Um, I will share with you as I learn, um, making sure I'm familiar enough with it so I'm not giving you bad advice. But if I just tell you what I'm doing, then hopefully that will be of some use. But yeah, that's why I've been pretty, fairly absent from here because, uh, you know, um, it's just so hard to to do everything at once and recording videos does take time. So hopefully now I'm a bit more comfortable with this and there's less set up and less, um, less learn, well not less learning, but um, yeah, hopefully I'll be back to posting videos a bit more regularly and some of them will involve this project.